Good morning again, church. Good morning. It's a blessed day to be in the house of the Lord today. You know, last Sunday I began the sermon with three words. God is good. God is good. And we looked at how God's will will be done. And we said that God's will can either be accomplished the easy way, which is through our obedience and submission to His will, or His will can be accomplished the hard way, through our disobedience and our refusal to accept or our refusal to submit to His will. But either way, whether easy or hard, God's purposes will be accomplished. In other words, His will will be done. And it's because He is good. Because he is good. He will see that his will is done. And because he is good, we looked at the phrase in verse number 17. If you already have your Bibles open, if you haven't yet, if you'll open them to Jonah chapter 1, we'll be looking at uh, actually verse 17 of chapter 1 and then all of chapter 2 today. But in verse 17, it said that the Lord, and again, it's all capitals, so that's the one true God, it's Yahweh. So the Lord Yahweh prepared. He prepared. He made the way for Jonah to be saved. He also made the way for the mariners on that boat to be saved. And by preserving the life of the prophet, he prepared the way for the people of Nineveh to be saved. Our God is good, church. Amen. Amen. I mean, he is, he is good. We can't even fathom the goodness of God and what it means to truly be good. Listen to the words of the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. Peter writes this. He says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but instead with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Listen to this. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Now did you catch what Peter wrote? Did you, did you catch what he said? Did you hear what God did to prepare the way for you to be saved? Listen again. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ the Son, the second member of the Trinity, was foreordained before the creation of the world, before time and space were even brought into existence. The plan was already set in motion. From eternity itself, before time existed, Christ was planning to come at just the right time, at just the right place, to be the just and the right and the only sacrifice to pay for your and my sin. I mean, how amazing is our God? I mean, how amazing, if you think about it. But church, not only is our God good, He's also merciful. God is merciful. He's full of compassion. We read that this morning in, in our psalm. Listen again to how King David describes Yahweh, the Lord. In Psalm 145, 8-9, he said, The Lord, Yahweh, the one true God, is gracious He's full of compassion. He is slow to anger. He is great in mercy. I'm going to pause for a second because people always, you might hear the argument, you know, I like Jesus. I like the God of the New Testament, but that, that God of the Old Testament, he's just full of wrath and anger and, and bitterness, and I don't like him. But here, the Psalms are in the Old Testament, and David is saying, the Lord Yahweh is gracious, full of compassion. He's slow to anger, great in mercy. He says, the Lord Yahweh is good to all. And his tender mercies are over all his works. And that would be an important part to underline in that Psalm 145, verse 9. It says, the Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all his works. That means that his tender mercy are over all his works. Not just the things that we perceive are really good and great and makes us feel good, but his tender mercies are over all his works. Even those things that we see and we say, that's a horrible thing. How did that happen? Or why is this going on? Or I don't understand that. His tender mercies are over all his works. Everything he does, everything that he allows, because remember, he either causes things to happen or he allows things to happen, but everything is underlined by God's mercy. It's underlined by his mercy. When the great storm was raging on the sea, 
The mariners knew. They just knew they were going to die. They didn't see any other way out. This great boat is rocking. The waves are coming. It's storming. The wind is on the seas. They knew they were going to die. But in that exact moment, God was showing mercy. He was showing mercy. You might ask, how, how was God being merciful in that great storm? How, how was God showing them mercy? I mean, they were terrified. They thought they were going to die. But you have to understand, these men on that boat, they were heathen. They were heathen. They were sinful Gentiles. They didn't worship the one true God. They didn't know who He was. And as Scripture testifies in Ezekiel 18.4, says the soul who sins shall die. They were sinners. God had every right to destroy them. He could have sunk that ship, killed every single person on board. He could have sent them to a watery grave and then cast their souls into an eternal hell and He would have been completely justified to do so. Completely justified. But instead... He didn't do that. What did He do? He showed mercy. He showed grace. You see, Jonah rebelled. And so God sent a storm to wake him up and stop him from running. And the mariners found out that it was Jonah's God. It was Yahweh, the one true God, who had created all things. They found out it was His God. He was creating this violent tempest. And so what happened? It was so that they would turn to the Lord. And scriptures, God, God's word says, they feared him exceedingly. And because they, they, they came to know him and who he is, they feared him exceedingly. And so they sacrificed to him. And then they took vows to serve him. And it took that storm to get them to realize that. The prophet Joel revealed in Joel chapter 2, verse 32, Joel said this, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, calls on Yahweh, shall be saved. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so even though they had to endure the terror of the storm, even though they had lost all hope, God was merciful to them. God showed mercy. Fear and terror were suddenly replaced with peace. And calm. Though they had lost worldly wealth and possessions, remember it says they took all their cargo on board. Somebody had to pay for that stuff. They tossed it all overboard trying to save their lives. So even though they lost worldly wealth and possessions, they gained eternal life. They gained eternal riches. And just when all seemed hopeless, they found hope. They found hope. In church, the same holds true for you and me today. You see, when we let go of just trying harder, I'm just going to try harder. I'm going to try and be a good person. I'm going to try and do more and more good things. Maybe God will be pleased with me. Maybe He'll overlook sins that I've done. Maybe if I just keep trying harder and harder and harder, you see, when we, we, we let go of that. And we, we, when we stop running away from God's will, I know this is what God wants me to do, but I don't want to do it. I've got plans for my life, so I don't want to do that. So I'm going to turn and run. When we stop doing that, we too can find peace and calm. When we stop fighting God, we find eternal life and riches. Stuff of this world, cars, houses, money, it's all going to burn up and go away. You're not going to take it with you when you die. That stuff doesn't matter. But yet we want to kind of cling to it. We let it go. We gain eternal life and riches. And we live in hope instead of despair. And when we do that, quite often we find the circumstances that we're in, which by the way, most times we, is, by, is our fault. The things that we find ourselves in, circumstances, it's, it's usually our fault. But a lot of times we find that these circumstances which we have created, it's actually God's mercy. It's actually God's mercy. So if you would, if your Bible's not already open, open your Bibles to Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Again, we're going to look at that last verse because it ties into chapter 2. Stand as you're able. We want to honor the reading of God's holy word. If you're not able, that's fine. But if you are able... We want to stand and honor God's Word. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17 and chapter 2. It says, Now the Lord, Yahweh, had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to Yahweh, his God, from the fish's belly. And he said, I cried out. 
to the Lord. I cried out to Yahweh because of my affliction. And he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, the place of the dead, I cried, and you heard my voice. You cat, For you cast me into the deep and into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. And then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, and yet I will look again toward your holy temple." The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit. O Yahweh, Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered Yahweh. I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of Yahweh. And so Yahweh the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that, Lord, not only are you good, but, Father, you are merciful. Thank you for the mercy that you have shown us. The fact that, Lord, that we were able to wake up this morning is a testimony to your grace and to your mercy. And so, Father, today, help us to learn the lessons from Jonah. Lord, I pray that you hide me behind your cross today. As I preach, Father, and I pray that any word that I speak, Lord, is not my words, but they are your words. May your spirit be in us and among us today. May your spirit go ahead of us, plow up our heart and minds so that the seed of your word today, Lord, the seed of the gospel will fall into good soil. And Lord God, may you receive the glory from it. May you receive all the praise and glory in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So friends, when we last saw Jonah, when we last saw him, he had fled from God. He had fled from God in disillusionment, and quite frankly, he fled from God in anger. He was angry. He was angry that God wanted to save his enemies. Jonah wanted to see the Ninevites, he wanted to see the Assyrians, he wanted to see them crushed and destroyed because they are awaiting on the border, afraid that they were going to come in and they had done horrible things. And so Jonah wanted them destroyed, but then all of a sudden God pops up and says, Jonah, I want you to go to your enemies, I want you to cry out to them, I want to save them. Jonah was angry, it's not what he wanted, so he fled from his land, he left his home, and he fled from his mission. So rebellion began with Jonah. As we see in the scriptures, reconciliation began with God. God wanted him back. You know, by all means, God, he could have just let Jonah die. He could let him die. He could let him drown out the water. But instead, he showed mercy and he showed amazing grace to such a blatant rebel. And he chose to save Jonah. And not only save him, but save him by a miracle that nobody would believe unless it had actually happened and they saw it themselves. It was a miracle. I mean, Jonah was swallowed by a great fish. He was in its belly three days and three nights. I got to thinking about it. God was given an opportunity to go and think about what he had done. You ever had your parents tell you that? You just go to your room and think about what you've done. Well, God gave him three days in the belly of the great fish to really think about now, Jonah, what you've done. And so notice in verses 17 and, and verses 2 and 1 what it says. It says, Jonah was in the fish's belly three days and three nights. Then, and you can underline it, then he prayed to the Lord. I don't know about you, but I would have been praying a lot sooner than after three days inside of the fish. Well, actually he did. He did actually pray before that. Because if you look over at verse 7, look what it says. It says, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you and into your holy temple. Jonah did cry out to God. He did cry out to him as he sunk to the bottom of the raging sea. In his heart and in his mind, he cried out to the goddess of his salvation. But you know, I wondered, well, what did he pray? Because it doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us exactly what Jonah prayed as he was sinking in the waters. How exactly did he cry out? Well, we don't know. It doesn't tell us exactly what he prayed. But it could have been as simple as this. He could have said, help God, help me. It could have been that simple. You know, as I read through verses 2 to 7, 
through Jonah chapter 2, I couldn't help but draw a comparison to how one might feel in the grip of hopelessness and depression. Very similar, if you read through it. Very similar. In other words, you feel like God has cast you out into the deep. Have I ever felt that way? That God's just cast you out into the deep waters? As if the raging waters have surrounded you and that try as you might to keep your head above the water, you feel like you just slip underneath the surface. You feel surrounded. I mean, look at verse 5. Look, look how Jenner described it. He said, even to the soul, even to the very depths of my soul, the deep closed around me. That sounds like depression. Jonah describes that it was as if the earth with its bars had closed behind him forever. Verse 6 said. Can anybody relate to how that feels? Anybody ever been there? Has anybody ever been with Jonah feeling that way, that you're just under the water? Bars have closed behind you. You're trapped. There's no hope. Maybe somebody's there right now. So what do you do? What do you do whenever you're under the waters, when the bars are closed around you, and you feel that that hopelessness has sunk all the way to your soul is penetrated? How, what do you do? How, how do you live? How do you get up and just keep going each day? Maybe you even you wonder, how am I ever going to see the sunrise again? Because everything just looks dark. Jonah was right there with you. He was experiencing it physically. Look at verse 7. He says, when my soul fainted within me. What does it say that he did? He says, I remembered the Lord. I remembered Him. And my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. When fear and anxiety and hopelessness sought to drown Jonah in the sea of despair, he remembered God. He remembered God. And by remembering God, faith arose. His faith. Remember, we, we walk by faith, not by sight. So faith arose. But not it wasn't faith in himself or his abilities or anything that he could possibly do to, to break out of that, of that jail cell that he was in. The clutches of death itself. But it was faith that God is merciful. And that God saves. He saves those who are his. And Jonah knew that. And though Jonah prayed, it says, from the deepest, darkest depths of the sea. Remember last week that I told you that Jonah's sinking in the Mediterranean Sea, the average depth is 4,900 feet deep. But the, the maximum depth is 17,280 feet. That's deep. And it says that he sunk to the moorings of the mountains, the bottom of the sea. So even though he prayed from the depths, his prayer, it says, was heard in the highest heaven. Though he was that far down, his prayers ascended to the very throne room of God, in the very presence of God. David actually wrote in Psalm 139, verses 7 to 10. David could relate, or maybe Jonah could relate to David. It says, David wrote, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. He says, If I make my bed in hell, and that Hebrew word is sheol, if I make my place in uh, my bed in the place of the dead, he says, behold, you're there too. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Friends, there's nowhere you're going to find yourself that God's presence is not there. He will be there. God is merciful to those who call upon him in faith and they trust in him to save. I mean, it seemed hopeless for Jonah. How could he possibly be saved? He's cast out into the sea in the middle of a storm. But our God is a God of mercy. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. God is merciful. And those who know and worship him have actually tasted of his mercy. But those who worship idols, it says, idols of the flesh, Idols of the intellect, idols of ambition, idols of pride, idols of self and self-will. Those people who worship those idols, they, they worship these idols as their gods. I'm just going to try harder. I'm going to do better. I'm going I'm to this or that or I need the money or the job or I need this or that. But here Jonah calls those kind of things worthless. He says they're worthless idols. 
they are unable to hear. But not only are they unable to hear, they're also unable to save you. This kind of thing's going to save you. And therefore, as Jonah observes in verse 8, they forsake their own mercy. You know, you ever thought, if I just had a little more money, then I'd be happy. If I had the right job, then I'd be happy. If I had the right home, then I'd be happy. The right car, the right this, the right that. You look at the celebrities and the sports figures who are millions upon millionaires, and they're some of the just the saddest, most depressed people you're going to find. And, and a lot of them will tell you, I thought that when I attained this, that would be it. And then they get there and they go, is this it? There's nothing more than this? They forsake their own mercy. They worship and serve anything and anyone except for the one true God. It's because they don't see their need for a Savior. I don't need a Savior. But notice in chapter 1 of Jonah, it was the fear of the Lord that brought the idol-worshiping mariners to cry out to Him. It was the fear of the Lord that caused them to offer sacrifices and vows to Him. And church, men and women must come to a place where they see their need for a Savior. They need a Savior. It's not a want. It's not life enhancement. It's not that it's going to make your life better, happier, things like that. But they need a Savior. Only when they see and understand that all of humanity, that we're guilty criminals waiting on death row, waiting for the day of execution and judgment, will they cry out to the Redeemer and Savior. Only then, when they see their sinfulness, will they see their desperate need for a Savior. That's the purpose of the law of Moses. That's the purpose of the Ten Commandments. It stands as a, as a mirror in which we can look into it. We can see God's perfect standard. Say, you want to earn God's favor? You want to be good enough? You have to do this. And we look at that and we see how far short we follow that standard. I mean, nobody, nobody is perfect. You know, it, but the law demands our perfection. That's what it demands. It demands our perfection. It demands our righteousness in order to enter heaven. And the law also shows us that we have neither. We have neither. And so God's law demands either we be perfect or we need someone to stand in our place on the day of judgment who is perfect. That perfect one is the God-man. Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, God incarnate. Not just man, but the God-man. So it's to Him that we call out. It's to Him that we cry out, Help me! As Jonah sunk down and he cried out possibly, Help me! We cry out. And it doesn't have anything fancy. It can just be, Lord, help me! I'm undone. I'm lost without you. Save me, God. Save me! church he's merciful and you know what if you cry out to God and you mean it he will save you he will save you if you call out to him in faith and trust look at verse 6 Jonah's praying while he's still inside the fish for three days and three nights look at how he prayed inside the fish he said I went down to the moorings of the mountains I went down as far as you could possibly go anybody ever felt like that I just can't get any lower I reached my bottom he's actually reached down to the moorings of the mountains he said the earth with its bars closed behind me forever and here it is look what he says yet you have brought up my life from the pit he didn't say, you will, you might. He says in past tense, you have brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord, my God. Jonah prays with assurance. He prays with as much assurance as if it's already happened, it's already done. Yet you have, not you will, but you have. In church, that's faith. He was still in the belly of the fish and he says, you brought me up. You saved me. That even in the belly of the fish, he knows that if the Lord is our God, if the Lord is your God, he will be to us the resurrection and the life. And he will redeem our lives. He will redeem our lives from the pit of despair and destruction, and he will redeem us from the power of the grave. The Apostle Paul quoted in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, Death is swallowed up in victory. He says, death, where's your sting? Come on, death, where is it? He says, oh hell, place of the dead, where's your victory? You're not keeping me. Church, Jonah's prayer here in chapter 2 is a great prayer of repentance and thanksgiving. 
Look at his conclusion in verse 9. Look what he says when he's contemplated all this, where he was and what God has done for him. Look at verse 9. He says, But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pray what I have vowed, for salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of Yahweh. And that tells us that a thankful heart is an obedient heart. Thankful heart is an obedient heart. And you can see the parallel here in Jonah to the repentant heart of King David. Hold your place and go backward to Psalm number 51. This is that great prayer of repentance. So Psalm number 51, amen, when you're there, starting at verse number 1. If you've ever wondered, if you're ever talking to someone sharing the gospel and they wonder what a prayer of repentance looks like, this is the prayer that you would point them to. This is what a repentant heart looked like. This prayer David wrote, this psalm David wrote after he'd been confronted by Nathan the prophet, after he had, he had gone to Bathsheba and, and had Uriah killed. So this is the prayer of repentance. Psalm 51, look at verses 1 to 13. And think about what David is saying. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you. You only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make known me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that my bones, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Look at verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. And then here it is in verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Thankful heart is an obedient heart. Church, Jonah had a mission to go and seek and save the lost. That's what God told him to do. Go seek and save the lost. And you and I, we've been commissioned with, that, with the exact same task. It's no different. Jonah chose to run away. But God is merciful and He rescued him from the mighty storm that he had caused. And it was caused because he was disobedient. God had a plan. His plans and His purposes will be accomplished. And friends, we can actually take comfort in knowing that when God has His plans, that He actually takes into account our actions or our inactions. He takes all that into account. In the account of Jonah, we see that God did not lead him, though, straight from the boat to Nineveh. He didn't lead him straight from the boat to Nineveh, if you notice that. But instead... The sailors gave Jonah over to the sea. They tossed him in the ocean. And from the sea, he was led to the great fish. And from the fish to God, he came back in communion with God, reconciliation with God. And then from God to the Ninevites. You know, sometimes our lives take many paths. Many paths. Sometimes we start out on the straight and narrow path and we're, we're walking, but then life, right? Distractions, things happen. Sometimes our lives take many paths, but church, I'm here today to tell you this. If, and that would be an underlined, highlighted, circled, if you are His. If you are one of God's elect. In other words, if you were chosen before time began to be adopted into His family tree, if you were one of God's, those paths will always lead you back to God. Will always lead you back. But it's that if, if you are really His. You see, if you are His, all these weaving, twisting, turning paths, they'll get you right back to God. But if you're not His, it'll lead you off into the ditches and away from God. Jesus Himself said this in John chapter 10, verses 27 to 30. He said, My sheep hear My voice, and I know them. I know them. He says, And they follow Me. 
He says, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That's comforting. That should be comforting to you. My Father who has given them to me, he says, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And then he says this, I and my Father are one. Friends, if you are his, he will not lose you. <clears throat> and if you are his, he will not let you go. He's not going to let you go. Look what he did with Jonah. Look at verse 9, the second part of verse 9. He says, salvation is of the Lord. It's not of you. It's not a decision you can make. That's of God. Verse 10 finishes out. It says, so the Lord Yahweh spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. You ever considered that the wind, the waves, all of creation is obedient to the voice of God? Except for us. We're the ones that rebel and say no. The Lord spoke to the fish and vomited Jonah on dry land. So I considered that. I got to think that you and I, you and I have been swallowed up by sin and death in the depths of our depravity. But the Savior cried out from the cross, and as he spoke to the fish, he spoke from the cross, he said, To tell us die, it is finished. The dead is paid. He spoke to death itself. It's done. It's finished. You can't have them anymore. And you and I were vomited out of the belly of condemnation onto the dry land, onto the shores of salvation. And it's not because of us or anything good in us or anything that we deserved, but it's because God is good and it's because God is merciful. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the lesson of Jonah. Help us to learn it well that it's not us who is good and merciful, but it's you who is good and merciful. Lord, we know that you paid it all so that way we could be set free. You spoke to death and sin. You told them, you told death and sin it couldn't have us anymore, that you are the master. And so, Father, we thank you. We praise you today. Father, we pray today that if there's any hearts that are not transformed, that you would do that act. If there are any today, Lord, whose path has led them away from you, Father, we pray that that path will lead back to you today. Because, Lord, you are salvation. Salvation is of you and of none other. And we know that any who call unto your name, any who call out to you, you will hear them and you will save them. So, Father, today we thank you. We praise you and we love you. We ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus.